Hello Smack Universe, welcome to a brand new episode. We are sure that you're gonna enjoy this one. So subscribe us wherever you find us, like us and comment whatever you see. Enjoy the show. But to keep the DNA, to keep the spirit, to keep those values of hospitality, of welcoming artists, of intimacy, that's the most important thing for me. And I will keep that forever. Hello there Smack listeners. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Today you are in for a treat because my most recent guest was Mathieu Chaton, the CEO of the esteemed Montreux Jazz Festival, where every year since 1967, some of the most famous musicians come to a little town in the French part of Switzerland to sing their hearts out. Mathieu and I talked about how his hospitality education actually applies really well to the festival world, about his relationship to his mentor, the founder of Montreux Jazz, Claude Nobs, and about the future challenges that the festival industry will face in the coming years. So listen closely and enjoy the show. So Mathieu, thank you so much for being with us today. How are you My feeling? Pleasure. I'm very fine. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I think what's always really, really interesting is um, maybe if you just quickly mention again what your exact position is and what a normal day in your life looks like in that position. <laughs> so m my name is Matthew. I'm the CEO of the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland. Uh, and I don't have a normal day, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and like every day is different. Uh, every morning with a smile on my face, that's... Uh, I definitely have a big chance to work in this beautiful universe. Uh, so I'm running the Moto Jazz Festival, but also uh, most of the companies that are around the ecosystem of the Moto Jazz Festival, a company for young artists, uh, emerging artists called the Moto Jazz Artist Foundation, a media and digital company called Montre Media Ventures, and Montre Jazz International, which is running the cafes and the festival of Montre around the world, So, which is really fascinating. When do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I sleep well. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm not a big sleeper, so uh, I don't need uh, so much hours. And, and especially in our business, there is a lot of connection with the US mm -hmm. or with Asia. So sometimes it's late calls or early morning calls. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, when you work in a domain that you love and you're passionate with, uh, it makes things a little bit differently. Yeah, I completely understand. I mean, that's what uh, keeps also all of us in hospitality, right? Because outsiders never understand why someone would work in an industry where you're not uh, really paid enough and you have long hours. But if you're passionate about it, then you don't care. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I, I'm sure you have a team, right, that supports you and... <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm a lucky man because I have a beautiful team, which is uh, as, as passionate as I am uh, for what we were doing. And that is also the beauty, especially after the two years of crisis and maybe the next months and years that we're going to have with this virus. Uh, it was so nice to have a so much beautiful team, passionate, uh, invested into finding new solution, finding new ID, keeping the creativity at the first level mm -hmm. uh, and not just sitting and saying that, OK, we're in a bad situation, but just saying, OK, what can we do? How can we transform that into an opportunity? Mm -hmm. And that's really powerful because it gives you it gives you power. It gives you strongness to move forward because mm -hmm. we have to move forward. Definitely. And can you maybe share like an example of what I don't want to talk about COVID too much because everyone's talking about it way too too often. Um, but maybe can you just quickly tell us um, how you and your team reacted to the crisis and maybe what one of the outcomes was um, for you? Uh yeah, you're right. So we don't want to talk about this COVID too much. Uh, but uh, I mean, very quickly, uh, when when we've all been cancelled in 220, uh, all the festival around the planet and all the cultural activities, uh, our thought was how we can just uh, keep something and uh, how we can just stay in the spirit of everybody, everybody, because at the end, the role of the culture business is really to enjoy uh, and to entertain the audience. So how can we, even we could not bring everybody to Montreux, how can we just bring joy uh, to the audience, being digital, doing some other activities. So we try to turn the table and to think out of the box and say, okay, we could not run the festival as usual, uh, but let's use our assets, our archives, our uh, posters, exhibitions, and uh, our stories about Montreux, and let's bring something to the audience, which is 
which is fun and which gives a lot of fun. That's our role. So we, we, we did that in 220, a lot of digital activities, and we had a huge success on that. In 221, when we had a small window of mm -hmm. do something, we decided to organize a festival, of course, with a lower capacity. Uh, and we had the chance we couldn't make it uh, in Switzerland. And um, we, we created a beautiful stage on the lake, a very small stage, 500 capacity only, but it was a dream. So uh, my goal and the goal of the team was really that's okay, we could not do the things that we normally doing. Let's think how we can uh, do a magical th moment mm -hmm. for the people that can join and also for the people that will be connected live and uh, that can follow the festival even they are not in Switzerland and I have to say that we we had a great success uh, during those two years I mean of course not financially because that mm -hmm. was not the goal uh, and the goal for us was just to keep alive the music and to keep alive the the the, the, the spirit, spirit of Montreux mm -hmm. Montre Jazz so I'm, I'm very happy with that and I hope we will continue that way. Yeah. And is there something you are taking really with you, like some of the learnings for a time post-COVID, if we ever enter this time? Uh, definitely. There was a lot of knowledges, <clears throat> but if I can uh, pick up one uh, and it's back to, uh, to my DNA, which is the hospitality. Uh, and we, we, we know how is important now to meet together, but also the kind of experience that we're going to generate for, for everybody in the audience. So we've seen that, especially after the COVID, is not a question of anymore uh, who is on the lineup and would I buy a ticket for tomorrow, is that what kind of experience will I have if I'm coming to Montreux or if I'm going to Barcelona or to London or to Madrid, uh, whatever, uh, is really the question of the customer experience, which is very close to my hospitab uh, hospitality background. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so so you're mentioning your background. Um, we are both um, alumni from EHL, uh, Ecole Hotelière de Lausanne. So mm -hmm. many people would say probably that it's not a classic direction to go into like straight after graduation um, to work for a festival. But what, in your opinion, did your education uh, in hospitality teach you and what you can use now in your um, during your time with the with the Montreux Jazz Festival? Was there... Like, do you, for you, does it, is it a, connect, um, a combination that makes actually a lot of sense? <laughs> it makes 100% sense. Uh, and, and especially in, in Montreux uh, for, for different reasons. Uh, just before that, uh, when I decided to enter the Hotel Business School in Lausanne is because I was passionating uh, about the way that we, we will learn like 36 different um works uh different cultures mm -hmm. uh and it's really when we were working for a hotel and hotel schools it's really open-minded because you, you you're learning cooking management strategy finance uh, uh hr everything it's really diverse uh, uh, big diversification and i discovered when i entered the montreux jazz festival that's fine and it's exactly the same uh we in the entertainment music business where the client is in the middle uh, and the most important is that the, the customer is happy. Uh, we're not doing a festival for our ego. We're doing a festival to have the smile on the face of the audience. And that's, for me, very close to what the hotel business is mm -hmm. uh, or the hospitality business is. Uh, so when I when Claude Naps called me to uh, join the festival as a sponsoring and marketing manager in 1999, uh, that was my first reaction. I would say, but Claude... Uh, why do you want me coming out from the hotel business? And the answer was straight away, is that that's exactly what we need. It's someone that has a, a sensibility uh, in, in the hospitality, in the service. Uh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And just to know that Claude was also a cook, uh, mm -hmm. And he did the hotel business school in Lausanne also in the early 70s. Uh, so that's funny because all the, the DNA of Montreux finally is based on hospitality. Mm -hmm. What makes Montreux different around the world is the how Claude was welcoming artists in Montreux and on a very simple way, just welcoming artists in, in his house, cooking for them, having good time with them. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds obvious, but it's not. <laughs> it's not because sometimes, especially in the music business, we think that, okay, the artist is coming in and out and play on stage and then go back on the bus and, and, and continuing the tour. 
and and Claude was just offering like a bubble of freedom and bubble of fresh air, intimacy uh, when the artists were coming to Montreux and just like spending two days in Montreux, three days uh, mm -hmm. having fun around their job. Because also what Claude understood very clearly is that is that I mean everybody thinks that for the artist is 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 fun to be on stage. Of course, it's their job; they love their job. But when you have 150 dates on a row around the world. Uh, like every day you are on a plane and every day you are in another country, another festival. It's a job. It's more. It's more like a job. Is it's it's a. Uh, of course, it's a passion for them, but it's it's uh, like you and me. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's our daily job. So if a festival like Montreal, a destination like Montreal, can bring something different at the table, like the home sweet home feeling, mm -hmm. uh, that makes a real difference. Uh, and that's exactly what Quincy Jones is always saying when he's coming to Montreal. I'm back home, uh, and and for us it sounds like normal, mm -hmm. uh, but for the artists, when I see their eyes coming to Montreal and having the feeling that everything has been thought like a concierge in a hotel uh, for the artist, I just give you an example because very often we have been asked, oh, "Can you give us a caprice of an artist?" Oh, special request or whatever. It's like a phantasm. <laughs> you know, that's what is the the last request of this artist, very special request. I mean, for me, there is there is no special request. It's just like it's normal that an artist doing like 150 dates on a row is looking for having like a kind of sustainability and kind of a, a home sweet home feeling. So if they're asking for a kind of water or kind of whiskey or kind of wine they're normally drinking, is because they need a stability, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's for me normal. So we we we're reaching all the expectation, even the crazy one, uh, because we think it's definitely one of the most important thing to make the uh, the the artist happy. Mm -hmm. And at the end, it uh, it makes the audience happy because the the show after that will be tremendous. And that's exactly what happened in Montreux with David Bowie, with Nina Simone, with Arif Franklin, with uh, all those big guys that played Montreux. It's just because they, they've been in a mood to bring something on stage that, that was different. Yeah, and you really see them as people, right? So what you just explained um, with Claude really welcoming them in, uh, into his home and cooking for them, like it's it's a whole different dynamic um, because yes, they're here to do a job, of course, but at the same time, they're human beings and they enjoy the same things that we all enjoy, being together with other people, being stimulated by discussions. And and I think that's really like what you also read so often about the Montreux Jazz uh, Festival, that um, for artists, it's a completely different experience and the hospitality makes a difference and it's so nice that uh, so it's the nicest compliment if someone says I'm home <laughs> who's actually not from that place um, so yeah just con congratulations on this huge success that's been on going on for years and um, yeah you just mentioned as well that you joined uh, the Montreux Jazz right after graduation from EHL. Um, so how did that really come about because I think your uh, history with Claude goes back a bit more right <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I've, I've met Claude the first time I was 16 years old and I was playing in a band. Uh, and I know honestly in Switzerland, uh, when you were talking about Claude Nobs, it was not only the founder of the Montreux Jazz Festival, but it was also the, the uh, managing director of Warner Music Europe. Uh, so he, he was a really big guy in, in the region for music. So as a young musician and not professional at all, that was one of my dreams to have one time a discussion with him or just to share my music with him. I, even I knew that it was impossible that I was going to play more true, of course. Uh, but it was just to have an advice. And as Claude was also an old friend of my father, because there was quite the same generation. And uh, my father was a scout with Claude in their early days. Um, so I took the chance to, to call Claude's office. And finally, he accepted to receive me in the office to listen to the music. And I was on heaven. I mean, just like it, it, nothing happened after that, of course. Uh, but I was just on heaven that I had the chance to spend like one hour with him. And it was an honor, to be honest. Uh, so I went back home and I continued my life. And it was just, uh, I, I decided to enter the hotel business school that was 19 years old. And I was doing some uh, <clears throat> some work at the Montreux Palace uh, just to 
win a little bit of money because uh, I mean, the hotel business school in Lausanne was quite expensive. Yeah, it <laughs> so, still is. <laughs> so I needed to pay my studies and I was working at the Montreux Palace and it was five in the morning and someone hit on my shoulder. And three years later, it was Claude that recognized me and said, hey, Matthew, what are you doing here? And I said, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serving uh, the people there, uh, but what are you doing tomorrow? And say, um, I don't know, tomorrow is Sunday. Uh, uh, do you want to come to the chalet to my house? Because I have the Monty Python's founder. He's coming with his wife. And do you want to come and help me to do the cooking and serving? I say, of course, yes. <laughs> and I went up at a chalet and the Claude was so nice. And um, we were only, there were only three people, Claude and the Monty Python guys and his wife. And uh, <clears throat> Claude asked me to sat around the, the, the table with them. And uh, finally, when they quit, uh, they, they, we spent like till four in the morning uh, with Claude uh, talking about the festival. And the family, he was talking about the festival, not myself, <laughs> explaining <laughs> me the stories. And, and, and that was beautiful because it was my first big moment with him. And after this, uh, this night, uh, he asked me, but do you want to come to the festival like a staff to help me and my partner, Cherry? Uh, to run the parties up in the chalet for the artist. So, of course, it was a dream. So the, after, uh, after the school, going up to the chalet of Claude and, uh, and serving the artist for the duration of the festival, that was just for me as a as musician, that was just a dream ever. Uh, so I did that during all my studies for, I mean, six years long. I did that uh, uh, in, in July. And uh, when I've been graduated from the AHL, uh, of course, I've, I, I needed to start to look for a job. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and of course, one of my dreams was to work for Montreux. But at that time, there was only 10 positions at the festival. And uh, I tried to ask Claude if there was any opportunity. And Claude, uh, I mean, he was in at the time of the festival. So no need to, to talk about something different than what was happening during the festival. And I started to ask other people, do you think there was an opportunity? And everybody say, no, I'm, I mean, I don't think so because it's only 10 position is mm -hmm. most of the time the bookers, the financial guy and operations and that's it. So it's okay. It's, maybe it's not for me, but, um, and, uh, by luck. And I know that this is sign of life. <laughs> uh, two months later in August, uh, Claude called me back at home and, uh, he said, do you want to still do something else than working in a hotel? And say, what do you mean by that? I say, okay. You can take over the sponsoring and marketing position. <laughs> so are you are you kidding? <laughs> it's it's not a good joke. <laughs> yeah, it's a massive position. <laughs> and uh, he said, "Yeah, yeah, please come in." And we started to work together. Uh, and I mean, that was so beautiful moment of my life. I remember it was the 15th of August. Um, and I entered this office and say, I'm, I'm there. And I had no contract. I had no salaries, but I didn't care at all. The only way was that I was working for this big house. And that was my dream ever to work for, not for festivals, but for Montreux. Because mm -hmm. for me, Montreux was totally different because of the spirit of hospitality, because the history that was behind, because the the way Claude was considering the music, the open mindedness in music business, um, having all kind of artists, not only jazz, but rock, hip hop, Latino, electro, uh, all those considerations, all those values of Montreux were so important to me. So, uh, and I'm still there 25 years later. <laughs> yeah, and that, that, that already says everything, no? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> exactly. But then, so over the years, you, you took on different uh, roles, of course, and, and you always worked really closely with, with Claude. Do you, would you say that he was kind of breeding you to be the next director, or was that something that you never thought would happen? Uh, I would say that a little bit differently because uh, Claude was really an uh, instinctive guy. Uh, and um, one year uh, after he hired me on sponsoring a marketing position, uh, he called me to come to a board meeting. And during this board meeting, everybody looked at me and said, okay, we want to give you the position of secretary general. And I was, I mean, I was 25 years old, uh, no experiences. Uh, and... Clearly, it was that uh, they were giving me the number two position. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I was quite, uh, I mean, of course, very honored, but uh, also panicking. <laughs> so what does it mean exactly? And I remember when we went back to the office with Claude in the car and say, Claude, what does it mean exactly? 
and he was smiling on his <laughs> on his car and said, "You know, I'm 65 years old. I have to think about the future, and uh, I will. I want really definitely build something with you in the future." And that was the first time ever we, and maybe the last time ever we talked about it. And then we started to work together. I still uh, started to learn a lot from Claude, mm -hmm. from all different works that was at a festival. And uh, I was 100% conscious that uh, I was not formed yet to take over, uh, that it will take time, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. Uh, and and I had no view on that. It was not like, okay, Claude told me that, so tomorrow I will be the next CEO. Not at all. And because I knew also that the festival would close baby. And and that's it. And and it will never be different. Uh, so for me, it was first a dream, a dream that I should take like every day, like a chance. Mm -hmm. And if it will continue, it will continue. And that's fine. And I think that Claude appreciates that a lot. Uh, that I was not positioning myself like, oh, oh I will be the next one. <laughs> uh, and that was never in my mind because I, mean, I, I loved so much working with Claude, being together, learning from him. And, and at the end of his life also that I had the chance to to give you give him also my my view uh, and that was the beauty of the work we had at the end of his life is that we were sharing mm -hmm. and uh he told me just one month he passed away by accident i remember and say uh, you know uh, i'm happy today because uh, uh i'm sure if i'm passing away one day you will talk over and you will drive with the same spirits but on a different way and in a modern way Mm -hmm. And that was the most important thing for me. That's it was never uh, the goal to transform uh, the spirit, to transform the model, to transform the festival that will fight with the new generations, with a new way of working, of course, and that's what Claude was expecting. But to keep the DNA, to keep the spirit, to keep those values of hospitality, of welcoming mm -hmm. artists, of intimacy, that's the most important thing for me. And I will keep that forever. And what an amazing compliment, right? If someone, if, if the founder really tells you, hey, you have understood what we are doing here and you have really um, made it your own DNA as well. And I fully trust you to go forward with this. That's, yeah, that must have felt also like a very, very big moment for you in, the, in, the, in, that, in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think if I may, that it's the, the best way of mentorship. Uh, because for me, a mentor is someone that's, helps you to go further and not someone that is asking you to do the same that he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what Claude did. He gave me all the keys. He gave me all the keys to move forward. Uh, and, and honestly, when he passed away and before he was passing away, a lot of people was asking themselves what will happen when Claude Knox was passed away because he's the one, he's the, he's the unique one. Uh, and of course, when he passed away, it was not easy for me because a lot of people say, okay, this young guy, what he's going to do, mm -hmm. uh, the festival is maybe over, etc., etc. But I was strong enough, thanks to what Claude told me, that I say, no, it won't be the end because I know where I have to go. I know that Claude is trusting me. Claude is trusting all the people that he put it on place, like also Thierry, his partner, and, and all the people that he, he, was, uh, he was working with. Uh, and we knew when he passed away that we had a mission, the mission to continue, the mission not to make a copy-paste, <laughs> <laughs> but just to, to transform the festival into the future. And that was a big strongness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is an, an, a big legacy that you take over, right? And uh, one of the biggest challenge, challenges probably in your life to, to make that switch of, yes, we are honoring um, the legacy and the DNA of what has been, but at the same time, we, of course, need to um, look forward. And um, you also had to bring in your own signature touch to a certain extent. Um, but but how did you tackle that change, right? Because also I imagine that the team itself, maybe um, there were certain um, ambiguities and, and, and people were like, didn't know how this is going to be uh, managed now going forward. It must have been a very special time and, and quite uh, full of challenges at the beginning. Oh, yes, it were. Uh, yes, it were. Um, but again, at the very beginning, for me, it was clear that is not a question if I'm replacing Claude or not. 
that was not the case. No, no one could have replaced Claude. That's it. The festival was his baby. He was the founder. Schluss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and we, we have to move forward. Uh, so for me, it was a said that the question is that how we can just continue this legacy, the spirit of that, uh, with the same spirit, but uh, entering in, uh, uh, also what the challenges of the future are. Uh, remember also that Claude passed away at the period of the music business was in total change with the social network, with the streaming, with all the stuff. And, and that was a period where we had to look deep into the strategy of the festival and where we want to be in the future. Uh, so uh, we, we started this to reinforce the values of Montreux, the, really the spirit of Montreux. And one of the most beautiful things, because normally when a mentor or a creator is passing away, a lot of his friendship uh, or partners, they, they are living because they say, okay, we had a great time. And I would have an stand, for example, if I'm talking about Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. um, he was a co-producer of the Montreux Jazz Festival, a very close friend of Claude. I would have understand like 100% if in Quincy would have say, you know, Claude was my brother. Uh, I had a very good time with Montreux. Uh, but I, now I will, uh, I will do something different. Uh, I would have understand that. Uh, and that exactly what not happened. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because Quincy say he called me just the day after Claude passed away and say, you know, Claude was my brother, but Montreux is my family. And uh, you can count on me. Uh, you can count on me to continue uh, and to help you to uh, leverage the legacy of Claude in the future. And Quincy was not an isolated example. And finally, Claude did the best thing ever for succession because he created a word of friendship, of passion, mm -hmm. of family, where everybody was behind us and say that we've been supported by Claude and now we're going to support you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was magnificent. I mean, the, this message was, I mean, when I took over and, and when I heard the media and some of the audience social networks say, no, no, it's over, blah, blah, blah. And that was quite tough for me of to course. hear that again. Uh, and on the other side, uh, your business, the artist, calling you and say that we're behind you and we will help you and uh, creating and leverage the legacy of Claude. That was the biggest, strongest mm -hmm. e uh, ever. Mm -hmm. And um, you forget all the other things and you move <laughs> forward because it's, you, you feel so strong. Yeah, because that's in the end what counts, right? And that gives you the strength and the, the strength and the support to to carry on and to also implement some changes because you know that the most important stakeholders are behind you and ta will tackle it with you together. Definitely. <laughs> so you mentioned before that, of course, um, right around when you took over, there were also a lot of new technical um, innovations and, and things obviously impacting the music industry and also the, the festivals, therefore. Um, can, you, can you share a bit about some of the things that you really had to change in the past few years to stay relevant? Because I think we're, we live in such a fast moving um, society and, and, and the time that we're, we live in that <clears throat> I can imagine for something that happens every year um, at the same time, like your festival, uh, so many things change all the time and you always need to adapt. Um, and that could be quite stressful, I imagine. Yes, it, it is, but also passionating. It's, uh, we, we, you're right, we're definitely in a moving business, <clears throat> like every year. Uh, what are the biggest challenges or uh, moves in the music business? Uh, and, and back to Claude, as as founder of the festival, but as a, a manager of Warner Music, if you in the eighties, nineties, or even till two thousand, uh, running a festival or booking artists, the most important thing for the artists at that time was they were touring and they were doing festival to promote an album. The most important thing for them was to sell albums. Uh, so if they were appearing at the festivals or uh, doing concert, it was. Uh, of course, because they loved <laughs> making some music in front of clouds. But the most important thing, choosing the festival was to make media releases, media articles, and to sell the album at the end, uh, and to reach the audience. Uh, because the money was made on selling album. Uh, when 
that changed completely because of the streaming and the artists were not winning any money on, on, on selling albums. They had to tour and to tour and to tour and to tour. Mm -hmm. uh, means that it was a kind of paradox because the artists were touring more. It was more festivals, more concert organizer, more promoters. So an offer that were bigger and bigger and bigger and a demand that was also bigger, uh, but not as big as the mm -hmm. offer was. Paradoxically, the fees was getting higher because the artists were less rare, uh, means that they have to bring more material, more production, LED screens, blah, blah, blah. And that has a cost. So the cost of an artist was like two, three, four, five times that it was in the past. Uh, so for a festival like Montreal, we has a huge brand recognition, but a very small capacity because our biggest hall is 4,000. You had fees getting two times, three times that they were in the past and you still have the same capacity of 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, you could not hire the prizes <laughs> ever, uh, but you should find new way of financing the festival. And that, that was the, 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 the big challenges we were facing in the middle of 2000, I mean, five, 10, et cetera. The streaming was getting stronger. Uh, we all know that big artists are winning money on the streaming, but not small artists. Uh, so th the business was completely changed. And the, the, the request of the artist, just give you an example. One of the big values of Montreux was to film and to record every single note in Montreux. Uh, what Claude did at the very beginning of the festival, and now we have the most beautiful archives mm -hmm. on the planet with 15,000 of hours recorded live, recognized by UNESCO as memory of the world, which is unique. Uh, <clears throat> but that was possible because none of the artists was recorded at that time. And Claude took the, the opportunity to record them and to give them the tape to do whatever they wanted to do that. And it helped to um, uh, show the brand of Montreux around the world because the artists were releasing live album from Montreux and that was, that was genius. <clears throat> but uh, 10, 20, 30 years later, as the artist was not winning any more money on selling album, the image came key. And you know now with the social networks, uh, your image, your name, your, I mean, your design uh, is your asset for an artist. It's not only the music you're producing, mm -hmm. but it's also uh, what kind of picture you have, what kind of movie do you producing? And it's also what the, the, the beauty of how the music is evaluating is not only music, is everything around that. It's a kind of marketing too. Uh, and, and that changed also the paradigm for, for festival organizer like Montreux, because now we had a, a lot of fight with the management to, can we record the, 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 the concert? Can we, uh, broadcast the concert? Can we stream the concert? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can do that, but you have to pay tons of money to do that. You're not owning the rights, etc. It's so complex. <laughs> uh, that's the, the way the money is redistributed is totally different. Uh, and that's. Uh, the, the big challenges and and then came the the COVID situation where everything was stopped uh no more concerts uh, no more culture everybody's at home digital was key uh and does it that mean that digital was key but it was bringing money to the artist no <laughs> uh so what will be the future what will be the financial ecosystem for the music business will it change completely will it evaluate it yes sure definitely and a festival like montreal has to adapt itself with this new generation we're talking now about nfts we're talking about mm -hmm. metaverse uh we're talking about a lot of new technology i'm not saying that the technology is a future of economic situation it's, it's maybe the other way around the technology is uh is a way of achieve a new strategy, financial strategy. And that's, that's the, 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 the technology will, uh, uh, will bring, br bring new uh, money opportunity. It, it will, in, in, in a way, when you're talking about NFTs, then in music NFTs is very interesting. Will it work? Mm -hmm. Will it be like a, um, a one way situation? And in two years, yeah, it's, very talking, mysterious, yeah. it's really mysterious, uh, but we could not ignore that. Especially an artist could not ignore that. When you say, for example, what happened with Doja Cat uh, and mm -hmm. doing an NFT is generating like a uh, thousand of dollars, it means something. Uh, and 
what would happen in the future. So this is moving so fast that we're not in a situation that we were 25 years ago that the question that, okay, Claude is calling a friend and the friend is coming to Montreux and we have a beautiful dinner and he's doing a beautiful concert at the Stravinsky Hall. <laughs> is is a little bit more complex like that. <laughs> more people involved, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the value chain is very difficult. And to be honest, just before Claude pass, uh, passed away, he was suffering from that mm -hmm. uh, because he understood also that the question of just pick up the phone and make an artist streaming and say, okay, I have a special project for you. And the artist said, yeah, I'm coming. That's great. We're going to have fun. Unfortunately, that was not the situation anymore because behind the artist, there was like 200 people working for him, mm -hmm. big management, big money. And the artist could not decide on himself mm -hmm. uh, for everything. He could, of course, sometimes, but there was so much financial um, implication that uh, in that way, the world has changed. So again, rather you sitting on a chair say uh, that was better in the past, Or do you think, or you just putting yourself in a situation and say, how can I keep this spirit, but transform it into what the new business is? Mm -hmm. And that's my role today. I say the, the spirit of Claude was this human factor, this intimacy, this way of bringing magic where there is no magic anymore. How can I use those tools of today and to keep this spirit? Uh, and that's the big challenge, but that's the most passionate challenge because you just move forward with this kind of spirit. And yeah, uh, you, okay, you, def for, you definitely have your work laid out for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's passionating. Uh, of course, you, you, I'm not doing the same job that I was doing 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Uh, my job has completely been transformed. Uh, but uh, is, is that not a, a, a dream work? That exactly. every year you can just move forward. You uh, mentally, uh, you've been challenged mm -hmm. uh, every year. I mean, for me, I like that. I hate to do a copy paste. <laughs> every, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm served. <laughs> <laughs> And um, you, you've also said that uh, apart from that, uh, of course, in general, just keep uh, innovating and, and, and keep staying up to date. Another challenge that, uh, of course, a yearly festival has is that how do you, how are you present all year around, and um, what are the different touch points that you that you have to be be be, be present for that the people don't forget about you, and that you also recruit, of course, a, a new audience that will then come to the festival. Um, and you, for example, started the partnership with um, the Zurich Film Festival, which always happens around October in Zurich. Um, is this one example of you know? Um, tackling this uh, kind of challenge as well that you associate yourself with um, other things that are going on in interesting markets for you um, so you're just a bit more present as a brand as the Montreux Jazz Festival uh, so that, that's a very interesting and very good question I will try to answer it uh, uh, in, in short way <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's part of the it's overall huge, strategy yeah. uh, to, to make it sim simple uh, if you I just give you Two examples. If you take Glastonbury Festival, mm -hmm. one of the biggest festivals in Europe, the asset of Glastonbury is that it's a huge festival, very powerful. It's a one event per year, but every major artist are getting there and there is 100,000 people a day and it's massive and it's impressive. Uh, Montreux, the spirit of the, the, um, the, the competitive advantage or the USP of Montreux Uh, is the creativity, is the human factor, is the intimacy, is the, the hospitality, again. Uh, so when you're in a business that fees are getting higher, costs are getting higher, capacity are small, you have a problem. <laughs> Because uh, you should change your business, your financial structure, uh, to keep the spirit alive, to keep the way that, I mean, Big artists like Stevie Wonder, Lady Gaga, Muse, they are still coming to the festival, in a, even you're paying less. Uh, so you wouldn't, you could not achieve that by calling the agency and say, you know, we're 55 years old, we're a beautiful festival, a historical festival, can you make a, a, a lower fee for us, please? That doesn't work. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, charming is a good way, but it doesn't make everything. So 10 years ago, Uh, we 
we were in a situation say, okay, we should take a decision. I mean, there is not a lot of uh, decision to take. Or we're reducing the festival uh, and reducing the capacity because we could not fight with those costs. And we're trying to find a new model. Or we're keeping the festival as it is. And financially, it will lose a lot of money. But we will keep the, uh, the, the, the spirit of Montreux and this legacy of Montreux. And we will try a new way to generate money outside the festival. And we were at a period where 99% of the revenue were done during the two weeks of the festival. So the strategy was how we can use our brand and our legacy to live all year uh, long and generate revenue that will cover the cost of the festival. Uh, goal was that, I mean, maybe in five years, 60% of the overall revenue of the ecosystem is generated by the festival. The rest is generated by something else. And it's why we created the ecosystem first with the Montreux Jazz Artist Foundation, which is a, a, a public entity uh, serving and accompanying the new musician. Mm -hmm. uh, it's why we created Montreux Jazz International, creating the Montreux Jazz Cafes around the world, creating the Montreux Jazz Festival license around the world in, in Rio, in China, in Tokyo. It's also why we created Montreux Media Ventures, which is a media and digital company creating, editorializing, and distributing, distributing our content uh, that will leverage the brand Montreux. So what is the result of that and what is the goal of that? Uh, it first to keep the brand alive all time that's a new right saying that maybe an artist in his head we say oh Montreux is still the mecca of music <laughs> uh, and I have to be part of it I have to be part of the history when I see for example the last video or an interview I seen from Alicia Keys uh, last year on on the Apple TV uh, saying that when I was 17 years old I've been to the most beautiful festival on the planet called the Montreux Jazz Festival. And I had a chance to see the most iconic uh, footage of Nina Simon playing Montreux in 1976. And that reminds me why I'm a musician and why I love so much the music. I mean, this is for me, thousand points. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, I don't know if Alicia Keys will come back to Montreux. I don't know if I have the money to pay her to come back. That's not the question, but maybe the what is happening in her mind at that time, that's more true, is one of the most beautiful festivals on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that helps is also for the new generation. So everything that we're doing now uh, is on a sustainable perspective. We know that we could not increase the festival to have 100,000 people coming every day. We know that. We know that our main value is our beautiful striving ski hall with the quality of sound, which is amazing. And, but we have to fight for having artists with the less fee uh, in, in a small capacity. So if you work on a brand rather than on the event itself, and, and you turn the table, that's the financial perspective is more on the ecosystem than mm -hmm. on making financial viable the event itself. My goal is that I hope that maybe in two or three or five years that the festival will lose a tons of money <laughs> because we're going to pay the fee that we need to pay for the artist. Mm -hmm. And we have something which is unique, but the um, money is coming from my side. Don't rem uh, don't forget that we are a foundation. We, we're not uh, a private company that with shareholders looking for uh, a return investment. Mm -hmm. We're a foundation. We are only goal is to make the music and the culture to, alive. To stay alive. <laughs> yeah. Not and to stay alive. Not, not to stay alive on our side, but really to keep our main goal, which is to keep the music and the culture mm -hmm. alive. And that, that's something for me important, because if you say we want to stay alive, it's an ego trip. Yeah. Uh, if you say we want to keep the music and, and the artist alive, then it's really that's our mission, mission. Dedi yeah. dedicated to the musicians. Well, I'm looking forward to what other partnerships and uh, other partners join the ecosystem because it really is a complete strategic shift, um, like you were saying, um, focusing on um, what else needs to be around the festival to to make the the festival um, yeah remain as great as it is. 
um, and it's definitely a challenge. But I'm I'm a hundred percent sure you and your team are um, ready for for to tackle that challenge over the next uh, next few years. And okay. I honestly, I also must say, I have not been myself, um, and it's it's really a shame because I lived in Lausanne for four years and I really should have made the trip but I'll I'll try to come next year <laughs> that's a promise are you, are you kidding you were living yeah, I in know, Lausanne I know it's, it, I've, I had to just be honest and you know tell you but uh... no I'm joking <laughs> but now I hope that I convinced you that it's something that should you should not miss Definitely. No, I'll, I'll make it work uh, next summer when I'm back in Switzerland. Um, and <laughs> so I always end my episode by asking my guests um, the same question, which is basically, what would you recommend um, young people starting out in our industry um, in hospitality as, a, as, as broad as it is? Um, if there was something that you could tell yourself when you were, you know, 22 years old, freshly graduated from EHL, um, what, is, what would be your words of wisdom to the younger generation? <laughs> uh, good, good question. Uh, it could sound obvious, but for me, the most important thing was uh, what we were saying before. First, trust on you. Uh, learn from the other and the, from the people that has most experience. Don't think that just because you enter and you're young and you're powerful that you just can kick out all the others that has most experience. Uh, but really think every day that nothing is impossible. Uh, and that was really Claude's, Claude's spirit. And Claude was behaving like a child of 10 years old, thinking that uh, nothing is impossible. And if you want it, and you have the passion, and you want to make make, make happening, you can make it happening. Don't think always that money is the only way to save things or to make things happening. Not at all. Just bring your creativity first, your ID first, and then the money will follow. And we never did a budget with Claude. <laughs> we did a project first, and then we were looking for money to make this project happening. And in the culture and in the music business, I mean, it sounds like a little bit irrealistic or irrational or crazy or whatever you, you feel, but I'm still behaving that way. Of course, I, I have a responsibility for my team and for all people working for Montreux. It's a social responsibility for sure, and that I have to <laughs> respect. But in a way, we also have to respect that the most beautiful thing in culture is to have no barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, so just don't let the others or the market or the constraints or the the pandemic uh, avoiding you to to have ideas. Keep your, st your spirit alive. Keep your mind open to everything and to the world. And sometimes don't forget to make two step back to have an overview mm -hmm. of what is happening and not the nose uh, in the front deep, and just yeah. following the trains too deep. That's my yeah. recommendation. Well, that those are the perfect last words. Thank you so much, Monsieur, for taking the time to, to speak with me today. My big pleasure. Thank you for having me today. And then hopefully see you soon in person in Montreux next summer. Uh, hopefully. You're most than welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it for this episode, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to share your thoughts on this episode and everything else that is going on at Smack with us by checking out our website at smack.media or connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Instagram. We'll see you next time. Guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode. We're so glad that you were here uh, and we hope that you give us a lot of love, a lot of comments and everything that you have on your minds. Follow us wherever you find us and stay tuned for the next one. See you.